Perfect. All right. We'll go ahead and call the uh, Capital Funding Protection Committee meeting for December 7th, uh, 2023 to order. Can I go ahead and have a roll call, please? Paul Anderson. Clara Andriola. Present. Elise Bunkowski. Charlene Bybee. Here. Chris Cobb. Andrew Diss. Here. Jeannie Herman. Here. Justin Ivory. Miguel Martinez, Devin Reese, Here. Dave Solero. Here. That concludes roll call. All right, thank you very much. Um, before we jump too far into this agenda, I would like to uh, uh, request that we move actually the closing public comment up to the beginning because we've got some people here to present a little something for, uh, for the school district. So if it's all right with uh, the group, I'd like to jump to item 3.01 and have public comment. Megan Sizelove. Excellent, thanks. Hi there, good afternoon. My name is Megan Sizelove, and I'm here today on behalf of American Public Works Association. I am a board member for the Northern Nevada chapter, or for the Nevada chapter. Um, APWA, for those of you that know, don't know, we're an international organization of over 600,000 members. And in the state of Nevada, we, our chapter actually recently grew to be the second largest chapter in the Western region with over 650 members. Our mission is to promote public works and provide education, training, certification, and networking to our members, as well as the public works community. We're grateful for the school district's long history of support and involvement in the Nevada chapter of APWA. Each year we host a spring conference in the south and a fall conference in the north. And during the, of that time, our agencies can um, submit projects to um, submit for project of the year in several different categories. And today I'm happy to present to Washoe County School District um, for the project of the new Pro Proctor Hug High School project. Um, they were the proud winners for structures um, of projects greater, greater than $20 million. So if we could have the project team come up and maybe do a quick picture and present the award, that would be great. So they can photoshop me out. Thank you. Is there any other public comment on this item? Pablo Navadoran. guys so uh, I want to say uh, so thanks for Adam um, seriously and uh, all the FIP team but I know it's not on the agenda I know it should be on agenda but it's not on agenda but, but I will not talk about defeated school at all but I want to say thank you for Adam um, seriously and uh, for the capital party team for making it happen at Huck High School where you look at new Huck High School that served not just for a student with a high income, but for a lower social economics 
stat stuff, but there are more to come. And then hopefully we should serve a better term for the school for next 10 or 15 years. So shout out to Adam Sisley. That's it. All right. Thank no you. No more public comment. All right. Very good. Uh, we'll take 3.01 off the off the agenda now. Um, moving on then to item 2.01, approval of the minutes for the August 3rd, 2023 uh, meeting of the Capital Funding Protection Committee. Are there any comments on the minutes? I'll make the motion, Mr. Chair. Got a motion by Andreola. Second. Second by Reese. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, passes unanimously. Takes us on to item 2.02, .02, which is a presentation, discussion, and possible action to recommend approval of the draft final district-wide facility modernization plan uh, by the Tr Board of Trustees. So, Mr. Searcy. Just a very brief intro, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thanks for being here. For the record, Adam Searcy, Chief Operating Officer for the School District. In a moment, I'm going to introduce the floor to uh, Paul Mills with Canon Design. But just by way of background, the school district's been engaged with Canon Design for over 18 months now, conducting a comprehensive assessment of our school facilities from the ends, lens of equity, efficiency, and community. Uh, just last week, uh, the initial reading of this draft recommendation was presented to the Board of Trustees for information and discussion only and received uh, rave reviews. This evening, uh, Paul's going to walk you through the entirety of the, their work and the final recommendations in hopes of sending it to the school board with the uh, endorsement or recommended for approval from the Capital Funding Protection Committee. So that's what this item this evening is. Uh, you've all heard multiple times from Paul on the work ongoing over the last year plus, and this is hopefully uh, the culmination of all of that work and the beginning of much more to come. Thank you. Great. Um, it's a pleasure to be in front of you again and um, quickly go through what I presented from this very chair to the Board of Trustees a week ago. Um, you should have a more detailed presentation than the one here. We have some excerpts here to really move it along, um, but that is of the record. And there's also now a 150-page document that backs up all of this work, but we're going to give you the high strokes of it. All right, so we're at the tail end of this process that, as Adam said, it's been going on for 18 months. It's foundational in nature, and as this image here implies, it really starts with guiding principles overlaid with data, which went to an exploratory phase where we explored draft options. The last time I presented to you was to share with you those draft, draft options that went before the community. And now we're at the point of decision making, which leads to action. Um, so this is presented to the Board of Trustees next Tuesday for acceptance and direction to staff to proceed with the implementation of the recommended, recommended actions. However, with the caveat that this doesn't supersede established policy um, and processes that are already in place for all sorts of things that are recommended within the FMP um, for capital projects, rezoning, grade reconfiguration, consolidations of schools, et cetera. So a quick recap of the options all in one page here. Um, the, I forget how many pages, but to the, the tome that we had of all the draft options um, that were explored and vetted through the community um, with all of the feedback and um, community survey information is um, documented in the, our final report. But we've listed here in different geographical or grade configuration clusters of schools those options that had been presented to you and which are recommended which are not recommended and then ones that are flagged for continued study. In the areas of continued study, I will signal that in the Pine Middle School and its related feeder schools that we've narrowed it down to options B and C with a recommended um, 2024 study of the pre-K through eight grade configuration of which there's only one example in your district at the very successful Mount Rose um, Academy for Language, um, which is a great study point but also it's a different magnet signature type school and we're recommending in order to confirm whether or not pre-k-8 is the path forward for option c that it be studied in depth and that would require some investment of time and commitment um, some exclusive staff to focus on it 
Um, similarly, in the trainer Sparks and Dilworth Middle School and their associated elementary schools, um, there's a similar scenario where the study of pre-K-8 would inform whether we proceed with option C or D. And then in the geographically remote areas of Gerlach, Incline, and Natchez Elementary School out in Wadsworth, um, that there be some focused continued study. It doesn't have to be long, but a recommended study phase which en engages with the local communities around their unique um, cultures as well as circumstances due to their geographical notion. Um, there are placeholders in the FMP for capital projects at all of those schools. However, there's an acknowledgement that the definition of those needs a little bit more work. So moving on to the recommendations, and really this is the punchline for the whole thing. This map here shows the investments. The size of each of those bubbles is representative of the investment of cost, um, and the types of outcomes for the different schools are listed there. And as you'll quickly glean from knowing where the crossroads of your major highways are, that the investments really are fulfilling the commitment of WC1 to invest in the core urban areas of Washoe County. And here's the big takeaways from it. All schools are improved within 15 years. And that's done with current funding sources, right? No new taxes, read my lips. This is about living within the very generous means that your community has already put forward for the stewardship of your facilities and all schools will be taken care of. Overcrowding eliminated district wide. And because of the the strategic, um, uh, what we call the trade-up strategy implementation we'll talk in about in a little bit, we have some avoided capital costs um, in the form of repurposed facilities that won't need to be re renovated to the point of being whole new schools. They could serve a different function which will have a bit more modest investment in those. $140 million over 15 years can be put to very good use. And here's the real punchline with this, the millions of dollars of operational savings that aren't just once, but year in and year out, because we are recommending the consolidation of schools and trading up to newer and fewer well-equipped new facilities, that there will be annual savings that can be reinvested back into the classroom where it belongs from your general fund. And also, as I mentioned, the pre-K-8 exploration might be a whole new model and choice um, for improved access to quality programs in your communities. So just a bit about cost estimating. I know we're about the, the meat and potatoes and really what's about delivering capital projects here with this committee. And all the dollars that are expressed here are in, in baseline 2024. Um, terms with the assumption and understanding that due to the majority of your funding being associated with sales tax revenues that that will actually go up with time as well so we're baselining it to that and so we don't have to worry about all the escalation and calculating what year that certain projects take place but there will be a reallocation and, and as a function of the management of the, the program. Um, so what we're talking about is over two billion dollars over 15 years there's 109 projects and studies identified here, and I'm going to go from left to right to um, walk through the types of outcomes. So we have identified that there are some on-hold new school projects, uh, specifically high school up in the Cold Springs area um, that have been envisioned and wisely envisioned when during a high growth mode when WC1 was commissioned, um, and also um, the on-hold project at Stonebrook. Um, we don't anticipate the growth right now being projected for the need for those schools. However, should the, the enrollment trigger the need for those schools, they'd be put back in and just be reprioritized within the CIP. Next, new schools and reconstruction. Um, the green band there is Newstead Elementary School, built on a property already owned by Washoe County School District on Silver Dollar Lane, um, which is part of a trade-up scenario I'll speak about in a moment. All the other ones are replacement, just like you did at O'Brien Middle School. These are on-site replacements of schools that are catalysts for trade-up scenarios, for refreshing um, and trading up from small, underutilized, half-full schools that are energy inefficient to brand new state-of-the-art facilities that are scaled large enough to offer a diverse program and have the efficiencies that will redirect more operational dollars into the classrooms. The big, tall 
column in the middle there are the renovation, revitalization, and general maintenance. The yellow bands are your youngest schools, which we acknowledge that over a 15-year period, there will be some reinvestment. It's hard to imagine brand new schools needing it, but there will be some sort of reinvestment in those facilities as well. Um, but the great majority of your schools will remain in, in use and will be supercharged with over a billion dollars worth of reinvestment in those facilities. The six purple um, schools are repurposed. These are facilities that as part of the trade up um, strategy would find a different use and the students will not be left behind. The students will actually be rezoned to either their existing school or a neighboring school that will be rebuilt. Now we acknowledge that over a 15 year period and with the mandate that these these trade up scenarios um, came with the caveat that any sort of consolidation or closure of a facility is only in the scenario where there's a trade up opportunity, that there's a better outcome for students. It's not just rezoning and going to another old school that's further away. This is about going to a completely renovated or rebuilt facility that um, might be a little bit further from home. Due to the notion of the time and commitment to doing those capital projects and this being a 15 year program, here at the very end of 2023, we're not going to name all of the names of the schools that are at the back end of those recommendations. We're naming groups of schools, and among them, some would be, as the next slide here conveys, some would be rebuilt, and some would be renovated, and some would be repurposed. And then we have the study and engagement um, column there where we have your remote schools, of which clearly in Gerlach and Natchez, there would be some sort of renovation of the schools they would be needed due to their geographic proximity and the outcomes for the three schools in Incline Village yet to be determined. But among all five of those schools, um, a flagged $81 million that's place held um, in priority order in the schedule and reserved within the budget. And here's the slide that lists all of the schools here. And if you have interest in a particular school and what's being recommended for it, this is kind of your place to find where they um, fit among those different categories. But I'm going to move forward. And if we want to speak to specific schools, we always can. But this graphic here kind of correlates with the map that I showed earlier, showed where all the major investments, the size of these bars represents the dollars invested. And it's broken down by the high school feeders and where those splits between Reed and Sparks, such as Dilworth, um, uh, that they would have find their way into their own column. But as you can see, working from right to left, Wooster, Sparks, Reed, Sparks area, North Valleys, McQueen, these are your older, more mature communities where the bulk of the, the investment is. However, you can see that every area, every school has some major investments. If you look at the far left, these are your newest areas or very, very small numbers of schools. Which brings us to the implementation of this program. Um, we listen to your community, um, both in, in person when we had dozens of meetings in, within your communities, in your schools, talking to stakeholders, and in conducting a, a, county, a number of countywide surveys, one a year ago and one this fall. And we had questions in there about how we ought to prioritize and package this program in a way that's equitable and responsive to the community. And we have devised this series of FMP initiatives conforming to what we learned from the community. I'm going to speak to it here on the timeline that you can see this is the 15 year timeline that legacy projects, as the name implies, these are the projects you've already committed to, right? This is Debbie Smith. This is the, the RISE program that will be housed at the same campus as Debbie Smith, as well as the replacement of Vaughn Middle School that are already in the pipeline. Also ongoing with your capital renewal programs that are perpetual, um, that's assumed as well. I have zero dollars on here because for the FMP sake, that's already kind of accounted for somewhere else in the CIP. That's the zero dollars. The study engagement is a modest investment in the very short term to help inform um, downstream decisions and capital projects that arise from it. Managed growth are the areas where we heard from the community that it's important to take care of those remaining areas of crowding um, that we have in the area, in specific up in the North Valleys area. Um, special alternative education is also lifted up and out in the high priority of your most vital programs serving um, the students that have the most needs. 
um, within your portfolio. And there are $42 million allocated for those programs towards the front end. Um, that follows that study engagement period because the district has, um, they have already started a master planning process for their alternative and special education programs that will inform what those capital projects want to be. The trade up project spans the entire 15 years that gets into those that series and cycles you might recall from the draft options where it's rebuilding a school, vacating another one, moving in, taking that site, repurposing it for a new school, which would trigger downstream consolidations. That takes a lot of time and it's a critical path of sequence of projects. So the $639 million for all of those projects spans the entire 15 year period. And then the remainder, that's that big column of all the renovations and maintenance projects. We've divided into three phases, you know, kind of the schools towards the beginning, the schools in the middle, and the schools towards the end that we'll see in the next slide. I um, heard three slides here that lay out kind of the timeline Gantt chart format. You know, this starts with planning through design and through construction and close out of the project for occupancy. And a few things I'm gonna point out about the CIP, the way it is designed. First year legacy projects continue, they're already underway clearly. Um, near term and, and longer term capacity is in this managed growth band um, in green to the left. But you can see North Valley's high school, which is subject to a um, recommended addition and renovation project, which in addition to replacing the portables that are on site, it will free up space within the main building so it can be redesigned with the floor plan similar to what you have at HUG with all of the um, flexible learning spaces and to really refresh and revitalize that school while we're in there taking care of the crowding. We have Newstead Elementary built on the Silver Dollar Lane site within that early time frame as well. Um, and it creates flexibility because we're actually building a new school. The Newstead long term is um, slated for repurposing, but it can in the interim serve as swing space for the replacement of Lemon Valley Elementary School, also recommended in the CIP, um, and should um, the residential growth in the area tick back up quickly, you have the flexibility of an elementary school site that could be um, replaced as well. You see at the far right there, Cold Springs High School and Stonebrook, those are those longer term ones that are at the very, very back end. And those can be reinsert and reprioritized if and when the triggers come for enrollment. So I'm kind of backtracking here to all those study engagements. Let me mention them to you. So we mentioned the pre-K-8 task force as we've referred to it. That's to study and determine whether we go with options B and C in the Pine area and C or D in the Dilworth, Sparks, and Trainer area, as well as those geographically remote studies. So that informs the special education um, and alternative education projects that I mentioned earlier. You can see those listed here um, at Turning Point. That's at the Hare Building on the other side of Reno High School. Um, that very vital program that um, doesn't have its own outdoor learning area separate from the high school and which really wants to see a lot of improvements that are listed in detail in the document. Innovations Inspire and Piccolo's Specialized Special Education Services Center um, also highlighted here. Among the trade up projects, the very front end, and this is slightly different from the draft options that we presented to you last time, is we actually accelerated and named the replacement of Echo Loader Elementary School, which would enable Corbett to be vacated into that brand new facility at Loader. And Corbett, because of its strategic location immediately across the street from Wooster High School, would help facilitate that major project at Wooster. In the interim, it can be used as swing space to help facilitate that project, but also in the end state, it can be either become part of the high school or have some sort of ancillary and um, related program, such as a pre-K center that could be a, an education career tech pathway for high school students at Wooster, as an example. But we saw that strategic notion as a cause to accelerate um, that sequence of projects. And then the longer term trade up, these are groups of schools where we're not sure which ones and we 
we could name them today. However, be irresponsible to name something in 2024 that it will be five years to 10 years to 15 years in the future when the actual action would take place. It will clearly be a point of reassessment of the enrollment projections at the time and where the educational strategies are for determining which schools are which. This next slide here is kind of the middle of the pack. This looks at phases one and two of your prioritized improvements. Um, we've always sorted with the high schools towards the top. So in addition to North Valley's high school, which we identified under the managed growth band, we also have Reed um, Sparks High School as well as Wooster High School that start immediately in this coming year. McQueen would be the next high school in cycle, and we acknowledge that it has a lot of priorities, in, including removing those portables that are out um, in front of the school. Then we have a series of renovation projects. Now we started right out of the gate that we, t we identified pilot projects at Matthews, Palmer, and Maxwell. And these are your pinwheel pod and sheep shed um, prototypes that we have. We've very intentionally included just one of each of those schools to really be studied and determine and figure out the optimal design for those schools on a little bit longer time frame so that we can have lessons learned from that and only after those projects are complete jump into the design and implementation of packages of projects for pinwheels, sheep sheds, and pods that can be at your choosing later on be determined to be individual projects groups of two, groups of three, groups of five, whatever most efficiently we have um, will work. We did engage with um, the AGC here in town and they were supportive of this type of implementation. These sorts of sizes and scales of packages could be one that could be readily and efficiently staffed in a way that allows them to provide the best pricing back to WCSD. And the third slide here gets into phase three. That's towards the very back end after 2034 time frame, the last five years of the, of the program. And these are your youngest facilities, but we continue down the way of the um, packages of those prototypical solutions as well as those youngest schools um, that will be subject to some form of reinvestment in their building systems as they need capital renewal. So we have a couple of images here we've studied um, and scaled back the renovations in a way that can be afforded to, to fit the objective of touching every school within a 15 year time frame. But that's to bring a lot of the amenities you have in your newest design specs, your ed specs for elementary schools um, at the sheep sheds, which would take advantage of those courtyard areas for outdoor learning with connectivity to flexible learning hubs like you have in your newest elementary schools. Um, as well as bringing steam labs um, and um, uh, makerspace types amenities to the schools. We also found similar um, sorts of solutions for pinwheels and for pods, of which we have several in your portfolio. And this last slide here, um, and then we'll take questions, is your timeline for this trade-up strategy. This is kind of the, the big, okay, where there's dramatic change in your portfolio, where we are changing a school from a middle school to an elementary school, or schools are being repurposed as the result of this trade up um, strategy. And these are all named here and listed here with the dates on it. And as you'll notice, those dates start as early as 2026, but that's three years from this calendar year that we're in today. Um, that Pine Middle School, at the, after the completion of the Vaughn Middle School reconstruction could be rezoned to the new Vaughn, to Marcy Hers, a really relatively new school, as well as DePoli, the same. Um, complete trade up in terms of facilities and scale of programs from the existing 1970s building that Pine operates in now. Now, upon the completion of that, um, would enable Smithridge and Dodson to combine onto the Pine Middle School, which at the conclusion of the study for whether it's going to be a pre-K-8 or a new elementary school, um, would look, continue that trade up in 2028. I mentioned Corbett earlier, sits in the middle there at 2027. And in those cases where it has TBD, those in those it, the scenarios where there's either um, recommended study to determine what the scope is, or it's in that long range um, uh, trade up scenario category where that determination would be made in the future. But if you're looking for a list of where you have all those changes, um, trade ups op opportunities, as well as repurposing, those are all listed here. 
So just a quick recap. Um, that's the, the WCSD facility modernization plan, right? All schools within 15 years within your current budgets that you have today. Overcrowding eliminated, $140 million that can be reinvested out of spreading it around schools that are half full and concentrating them on bigger, better projects. Millions of dollars of annual savings that can be reinvested in the classrooms as well as study of new pathways um, that create new access to quality programs for families and students. With that, we'll take any questions. All right, do we have any questions for Mr. Mills? It's Bybee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, question on the Stonebrook. We were looking at a possible Stonebrook Elementary this fall, depending on numbers, because of our growth out. And, uh, and that's obviously in Sparks and in my ward, so I have particular interest in it. But um, you got it pushed all the way out to 2039. We're at the end of looking at Cold Springs High School and Stonebrook Elementary. How, how have we I know we don't need it today but I thought we'd be looking at it the next year or two um, because we know the amount of houses and we're seeing what the trend is for the amount of kids going to school there. How are we looking, pushing it that far out when our new schools that are nearby are already full and have portables? Thank you. I'll take that one. It has a little bit more to do with our ongoing CIP and I think it's a good opportunity to highlight the fact that this is a plan uh, that forecasts 15 years into the future that we reevaluate um, at minimum annually. So in conjunction with our, CI, our, our five year and our annual CIP, which we will continue to bring back annually uh, to this committee and to the board. Um, you know, since uh, the, the Capital Funding Protection Committee did approve the budget for the construction of the Stonebrook Elementary School, uh, the Board of Trustees reevaluated the need relative to the enrollment and pro enrollment projections at all the schools in that region and directed us to not build a new school but rather rezone that enrollment. So based on our enrollment projections in that region, we don't anticipate the need for a, an additional elementary school for that amount of time. That said, this is continuously reevaluated, and should that need materialize faster than currently projected, we'll revisit it and reincorporate it into the CIP. Can I do a follow up? So, where are you going to rezone them, and where is there room, or will they be a long distance that they're being bused to another school that does have room? That's a huge concern because families are not going to be okay with that. Yeah, so uh, the School District employs a sort of a sister committee to the Capital Funding Protection Committee called the Zoning Advisory Committee. We conducted meetings in September, October, and November, public meetings um, with that committee and the community, including in November at Sky Ranch Middle School, where we analyzed upwards of eight to 10 different complex scenarios to rezone re the enrollments from Bohatch and Sky Ranch into existing neighboring schools. The final recommendation from the committee was approved last Tuesday by the Board of Trustees uh, to rezone a portion of Bohatch into Spanish Springs Elementary and a portion into Van Gorder Elementary, all of which have ample room to accept those students without overcrowding and relieves the overcrowding at Bohatch for many years to come as well as rezoning a portion of the Mendive, or pardon me, Sky Ranch middle school students into Mendive. Um, and I'd be happy to, you know, share links with, with the committee after the words, but, um, you know, it's, these decisions are not made lightly, but uh, they were made very, you know, in partnership with the public and kind of in the best interest of everyone involved. Okay, so rezoning would occur for next school year? Thank you. Great clarification. Yes, the action was to be effective the 24-25 school year. Maurice? <clears throat> Mr. Solero, thank you so much. Um, I have a, a number of questions, so bear with me. They don't go in any particular order. I wanted to start off by thanking Canon Design for the work that's been put in. It's obvious that uh, the work has been iterative and comprehensive, so thank you for that. I also think, and Mr. Searcy, you mentioned earlier, 
the importance of the flexibility of the plan. And this is something that is important to me because, you know, I sit in a different role and a cheap seat up here where I get lots of things to ask questions about, some of which are related to uh, parts of town that I have a particularized interest in, others related to general um, statements about um, what my hope is for the school district. But all of those are not, uh, I think, as fully informed as Canon Designs or yours, Mr. Searcy. So please bear with me as I have some questions. Uh, the first is really about McQueen High School, uh, the best high school in northern Nevada, um, where I attended school and my children also attended school. Uh, a little bias for the Lancer Pride. Um, but I guess um, I see it as being in your um, your timeline as being out in 2027. Um, and I had hoped, of course, based on what I understand to be the conditions on the ground there, that it would be much sooner in the the planning process. So what is the criteria under which a school is evaluated to be therefore placed in line? I mean, obviously there are many deserving schools. We want all our kids to have great school experiences and whether we're, um, you know, we're pitching something that is important to us in our heart, what we want is for equity across our school and, and all of our levels, elementary, middle school, high school. Uh, and so how, how do you prioritize one school over the other? How, how was it done? It's a great question. Um, it's data informed, but also brings in wisdom of um, educational strategies as well as the practicality and critical paths of getting projects done. Um, the We actually also used survey results from the community to help inform some of the weighting of the data that we use to inform um, the sequence of the projects. But as part of our work was to do a benchmarking study of all the schools. And I'm trying to remember which month we presented some of the findings to you, but with the green, yellow, red yeah, um, so outcomes. Yeah, we had like holes in walls and different kinds of things. I totally remember. Exactly. Um, so it was roughly 70% of the weight came from the results of the facility study that we did. That weight wasn't arbitrary. We actually used the survey questions um, where we asked that relative to another question about serving students with the most barriers to education, which was a little bit lower in the weighting, um, around 30%, but we factored that in as well. So when all those were factored in, it gave us a, kind of a way to index and benchmark the schools. However. I, I don't like to use the term data driven, which informs that there's an algorithm that does all the work. Um, it, there's actual human wisdom and intervention on there, so it's data informed. Um, so we took into consideration how to um, implement projects, how to support educational initiatives, the notion of doing these trade up scenarios had a critical path that really wanted to span the entire time frame. Um, as well as looking at the optics of um, where the money's being spent. So we're not spending it all on the front end in one area and not towards the, um, you know, completely um, absent on the back end. So there's a bit of, um, uh, you know, a lot of calculus that went into it. So it, it's not the simple way to say, here, look at this math problem, here's the formula. Um, but I will say that it was done in with the eye for equity across the county. and. Um, we looked at cash flow as well. And while with WC1, you have a great number of resources that come in the door each and every year that we can't do 15 years worth of work all in the first year. So there will be some schools that are second, third, fourth, et cetera. Well, for my part, and so that I can close out this particular question or line of questions, um, I have spent the better part of 10 years coaching at McQueen High School as a volunteer debate coach. So I'm in the building. I've seen some of the repairs that have been done, and, and quite frankly, those have been necessary, including flooring, some different kind of HVAC work. But I will say the portables continue to be a significant problem at that school. Yes. Um, it is something that I think uh, none of us can really be proud of, and so it's hard to see brand new schools and other schools being remodeled while they have um, some what I would consider not ideal conditions, including in their science facilities, which are not particularly modern when you compare them to some of the other ones, as well as their art um, and, you know, sort of art areas of the school. So my pitch is just to say that as Canon uh, evaluates and as the school district looks at it on an annual basis, uh, consider that uh, in, in your thought process and certainly let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Um, the second thing I wanted to raise is I did not see and I continue not to see very much emphasis placed on administrative facilities. Um, I am someone who believes that these administrative facilities that we're currently in tonight are not um, doing right by our administrative staff and the professionals who use these buildings. And so what is the plan 
as I've asked before, for improved access to administrative facilities for our school district. Uh, I'll take that one. Adam Searcy, for the record, the uh, replacement of the school district administrative facility was included in, in the last year's five-year CIP. It's excluded from this scope. I see. Um, it, you will see it again in coming months as in the next iteration of the five-year CIP. Um, and it, I think is a good opportunity to mention, Paul kind of sped through the conversation around these repurposed facilities. There's a number of them that, that were identified. Um, they're, they're termed repurposed for a reason. While that might mean closure to many who have lived and, uh, you know, participated in, you know, elementary school for generations there, they're perfectly good buildings. And they can and are intended to be repurposed literally into highest and best use. And whether that's the satellite office of the school district police department, um, there is a responsible remodel budget in the recommended FMP for that repurposing. Or it could be some strategic partnership with a member agency, you know, to form a, a pre-K center or um, a senior center, you name it. Those are to be determined. Um, but they're really tremendous opportunities to serve the needs of our community and perhaps the administrative uh, office needs of the district. Um, but there is and will continue to be a very significant element of the CIP, which is separate and in addition to this facility modernization plan scope um, that we're going to bring back to the committee and, and execute in the immediate years. Well, and part of my inquiry was because at this body we have often talked about whether or not we would combine elements of administrative facility with a school site. I think there was originally some talk of that at the uh, Debbie Smith site. Uh, and so just, again, a good question um, in part because, for example, this room can be very small and for the needs of our community who comes here to engage in the um, you know, democratic process, I think we can do better. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and Mr. Schlero, I have about three more questions. Would you like me to continue? Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Um, what about, um, so when we were uh, originally designing and, and the beautiful construction that has now occurred at Hug High School, uh, one of the original plans called for the building of a swimming pool there, um, and it was you know, a, a dream, right? It was an expensive dream at times. And so has there been any discussion about whether or not any of the school sites would include a swimming pool facility? Um, it feels like uh, even though that we have, we are under construction for the Moana Springs Aquatic Center, we're still a number of pools short in this community. And in, in my mind, um, having a pool at a high school especially uh, would be particularly relevant and helpful whether that's in Cold Springs or at the newly rebuilt Wooster it, it just seems we're missing an opportunity to do something both for our students and the community that could be a win-win so is this something that has um, just decidedly fallen off or not within the purview could it be studied the specific scopes of these renovation projects isn't defined okay. um, there are ample budgets, particularly at the high schools, dozens, in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars that are allocated in the CIP or in the FMP for these high school renovations, which could manifest themselves in whatever way going through a design process. Um, it could wind up being, if there's a high priority for aquatics, whether it's regional and can serve several schools, et cetera, that could be. Um, it's just not determined and defined yet. In well, the we FMP. have some experience with that, right? We have regional facilities that are larger football fields or soccer fields that are intended to host regional events. We have done that, but my plea to you is that we include that concept as we move forward because uh, I think our school board trustees uh, and our sister agencies <clears throat> who sit on this dais uh, would be uh, happy to collaborate if there are a way to do it where we have the opportunity to provide for more aquatics in this region. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely devastatingly painfully clear that we do not have enough swimming pools and we have kids who are diving and they're doing swim team and they are making do wherever they can. I, I look at Reno High and Galena specifically who I know have excellent swim programs and they're finding pool time wherever they can. So again, an important component of my ask. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, maybe tolls specifically, but more a general question about these sheep sheds 
pods and pinwheels um, because I see those as um, you know interesting fixes for especially elementary schools which is where I think all of them ended up being um, why tolls is not eligible for any of those because it's not on any of the list that you've identified but is it because tolls is so old that it just needs to be scraped to the earth and redone what was the thinking there as to why they were not eligible for some of those what I'll call remodels uh, we identified within the um, Clayton feeder pattern of which tolls is one of four schools um, that there would be two reconstructions and two repurposes now we identified tolls specifically because of its strategic location adjacent to um, uh, Clayton Middle School with the community assets that are there with a pool that we went ahead and named that as one of the keepers Right, so it would be actually subject to a complete rework, reconstruction of that campus, um, which would facilitate a long-term trade-up scenario within that area. Well, it looks like Clayton is part of that overall plan because you have it designed in the both projects. I, yes. I suppose, of course, I'll make a pitch to say that those tennis courts need lots of help. Um, they have oh, yeah. not been functional in, <laughs> in 20 those. years since I went there. So another great school, Clayton Cubs. Let me ask um, about, and then I, I think I've only got two more questions. Um, the question next really is an overlapping question related to our public lands bill that is something politically is happening in our region. In the public lands bill, I think there have been a number of jurisdictional asks that impact the school district. Either they are asked for lands that would be used for sites for future elementary schools. I know that one in the North Valleys in particular, Mr. Sirsky, you and I have had conversations going back as far as five or six years. Um, and then even on, and I'm not sort of asking your position on the public lands bill, I understand it's being introduced in Congress perhaps later this week. Um, but my, my question is, there are other areas of town where I believe fundamentally as we have approved projects in them that there are land dedications that are intended to benefit the school district. And so Verdi, for example, the Sonterra project that exists up above Verdi Mogul or the Talis Valley project has a number of different school sites in it. Um, I don't see any of those contemplated in this particular plan, meaning is it that they're so far out and far removed from what we're doing that they have not been contemplated, or is it that um, when they get built, maybe we'll talk about them? Does it make sense what I'm asking? I'll, I'll give you an example, very specific, Verdi Elementary School is a cute school, cute as a button, great families out there. It is really almost not functional, I don't think, other than the fact that we've got very little humans attending there. But it's a cute school, but I presume that at some point in time, the Verdi Mogul area will either need Verdi, and I see Verdi in the plan here for um, some refresh. Um, but when you have Verdi and then you have across the freeway another school site, I'm trying to understand how do we contemplate those things within the plan or is that more about the perspective iterations of the plan? If I could, simplistically to answer your question, and I appreciate you highlighting that, you know, there are uh, parcels that the school district owns not dissimilar to the Stonebrook parcel. There's, there's multitudes of them that are either owned outright or under some form of MOU for future when and if needed acquisition. All of that work is essentially in addition to this FMP within our overall CIP. Now, should the need arise more swiftly than anticipated currently for one of the, that growth uh, relief or that w growth, uh, we would meet that need um, in a timely fashion. It may cause us to delay some of these other improvements, but it's not shown explicitly here because this is just narrowly focused on improving all of our existing schools, but it's absolutely on our radar continuously. Any other questions? Mr. Dis. Let's talk about Pine. So you have it listed here um, uh, to possibly rezone to DePauli, Hearst, Vaughn. Um, Pine is, I'd say, located in an economically disadvantaged area part of town, a lot of low-income families um, that might face hurdles in transporting their children to a school that's farther away than where Pine is currently located, close to their new house. What, what kind of thought and discussion went on um, when considering these lower-income schools and the burden it might place on families and, 
um, when it comes to shipping them to a new school, busing them? Um, just talk me through the process. Your um, your scenario about um, access in close proximity in a low socioeconomic area was one of the major considerations for option C in that area in which it would actually be rebuilt as a pre-K through 8 program sized in the realm of 900 or so students that would accommodate the immediate area. Just like right now some families enjoy the older siblings being able to drop off their kids at um, Smith Ridge before going to Pine, they would be actually all on one campus. It would be designed in a way with the appropriate separation of the different age groups, but that was one of those scenarios that we're recommending to study and determine if the district is ready to go a little bit outside of where they normally operate with one sole school right now, which is a language program in the pre-K-8 space. It's just one that um, we, we need it to go beyond just facilities driving it. It needs to be an educational mission for it. But the other option would involve different um, transportation set work, setups where there would be increased transportation for your middle school age students, but they would all be trading up to larger, better equipped and newer facilities at HERS, Dipoli, and the new Vaughn. And then um, I had the chance a couple days ago, um, we went and visited the communities and schools site over at Bernice Matthews, and they also have a Head Start program over there that's located in a portable that's not connected to the school. Has there been thought about providing space at new builds for these organizations like CIS that provide wraparound services for these families? Because I know that there's a lot of principals who would like to have their presence in their schools, but there's just not space for them because they're an old school and they need it for classrooms. Communities and schools at Vaughn originally started in the boiler room, but there was such a need that they were willing to put up with those conditions where they're just like sweating their face off in the middle of January in the boiler yeah. room because it, that school needed it. Um, it. Kind of back to the earlier question about aquatics and stuff, we didn't get into all the specifics of design. However, these projects are amply budgeted to where they could accommodate moving to closer towards um, the new ed specs that you have when you're designing new schools, which have family resource centers and all these sorts of amenities and spaces bespoke within those designs. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask a related question? I just didn't want to move on from Pine since Mr. Diss was so kind enough to bring it up. You know, Pine, also a school I attended, go Patriots. Um, <laughs> On the back side of Pine, of course, is is it Jamaica Park? I, I, I never understood why we have yeah. that name for that park, but there's a, a large park with related ball fields. I often wondered why we are not doing what we did at O'Brien, uh, where we have rebuilt the school adjacent to it, meaning is there a way for us to partner as owners of the park, let you build the school on this site, which has got great access, obviously, to McCarran, and then do it might be a pre K through eight whatever you're saying there, I just don't know how you rebuild on that same site unless you move over to the park as your building site and then remove and place a park and then I suppose Smithridge uh, becomes one of these repurposed facilities but um, uh, another school I went to um, and uh, I moved around a bit um, <laughs> you've been to all so of them. again I this is my my point to you was to remark that. Um, you have partners in the cities and the county um, that would love to help you facilitate what you want to accomplish and benefiting our students. And if that means we had a park that was gone for a year and a half or so while we built there and moved over, this is always something to be discussed or worth pursuing. If I could just re respond to that, I first of all really appreciate that. And I think everybody can connect the dots and see how these rabbit holes go. Um, you know exactly how we va build a new Vaughn, vacate Pine, and then reimagine what that campus can be. It, this is an opportunity for me to emphasize, Paul kind of touched on it, glossed over the fact that all of our current processes will be implemented on all of these projects, whether it's an annual CIP review or whether it's uh, basic design phase funding approval at Capital Funding Protection Committee, whether it's rezoning that will inevitably ensue and when many of these schools, the processes, the approvals, the independent committees, the public community engagement, that's how the sausage will be made. This is still a 30,000 foot level, but 
each and every one of these projects creates tremendous opportunities that are uh, only magnified with the types of community partnerships that you described. So thank you. Mr. Ivory. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry for my tardiness today. Um, first of all, um, you know, I couldn't be more excited about this program and the way you've laid it out um, strategically is is really quite fascinating actually I mean that like Adam says every time you make a change a domino falls right and now you've got other issues to work with so I appreciate the process that goes in mine is more of a logistics question for Adam perhaps and and I, I know I'm, I'm looking at the timeline sheet um, and I know I can't just be like, okay, straight line, straight line, you know, but it looks to me like with the two legacy projects that we've got in the works and in the first five years of the program, we're going to be spending close to maybe a billion dollars in the first five years. Is that sound correct? Not quite that high, but it is a little more front loaded than back loaded. And we had conversations with CFO um, about cash flowing this, and um, we had to lay this out in a way, and we, we feel confident um, based on that interaction that this is deliverable. So, deliverable as far as or feasible, I should say. Yeah, uh, based upon the money we have coming in through our funding mechanisms and stuff. So, my next question to Adam is. Where are we at on staffing for this? Because, you know, it's, it's like the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the thing everybody says all the time is, oh, we're going to build another school. Where are we going to find the teachers to fill that school? Where are we going to find the people we can't hire? I, I can't imagine that we're looking at hiring consultants to help us get through the management of this when we're looking at a program of spending $2 billion over a 15-year time period, and then I'm – I'm not positive, but I'm going to go out there on a limb and say, when we're done with that 15-year process, we're going to turn around and spend 15 or uh, two billion dollars on the next 15-year project. Um, so my question becomes, where are we at with staffing? Where, what are our goals, um, and and what are our plans for bringing in enough people to manage all this work? So just to be clear, uh, school district, like teachers and whatnot, uh, there's not additional schools proposed here. We'll actually be consolidating. So from that standpoint, um, while we always need as many talented uh, staff in the schools, this will actually help the current staffing levels. You know, we rely heavily, as, as you all know well, on industry partners. Um, you know, so we're, you know, we have several in the audience here with us today who are um, going to be important teammates going forward in de delivering these complicated projects. You know, that said, when we start to talk about the kind of uh, dollar figures that today's construction really costs, um, you know, they're, they're larger numbers than ever, but the scope and the details of these projects um, are not beyond the capabilities of our current team. We will continue to engage um, partners, whether they're architects or uh, construction management consultants or whatever might be needed to temporarily augment our resources. But not only do we believe we have the financial resources to deliver this, but we believe that we have the staffing and industry partnership resources in this community to deliver on this program. It's fuzzy, you know, I mean, it's a 30,000 foot level plan, but we're going to dive in and roll up our sleeves and this is not an unattainable scope of work. So we're not actually looking at adding more staff to the capital and because and, and so we're clear, I, I didn't want to misconstrue this. I'm not talking about adding more teachers. I get the fact they've got their heavy lift over there on, on that end. This is capital improvement. What I'm talking about is the staff uh, um, in the capital improvement staff that's all here tonight that's all nodding their heads going, yes, we've got a heavy, heavy lift here. Um, I, and, and I guess what I'm saying, Adam, is I, and I know we've had these conversations, but 
in my opinion, like in previously with the funding mechanisms that we've had for schools, it's been um, boom and bust, right? All of a sudden, oh, we got some bonding money that freed up. Okay, we're going to build a bunch of stuff, and then we're not going to have anything. That's not where we're at now. We've got a pretty good funding mechanism coming up. So I guess my question is, at what point are we going to, and, and, and what are the plans, perhaps, of how we're going to get to a staff that can maintain and keep up with this kind of um, construction? You know, I will say that Tammy Zimmerman and the team have done some recent um, internal analysis of some, some reorganization, uh, uh, project management office, so to speak, to, to really manage the entirety of the program while allowing specific members of the team to focus on design and construction phases of the project has been considered. That's not a significant addition, maybe a couple of additional positions. I think, you know, commensurate with the, the degree of specificity of this plan, uh, we, we feel we do have the team. Again, in tremendous partnership with a variety of consultants and contractors, these will be complicated, more technically difficult projects to execute than, you know, a Greenfield new elementary school. Um, but we're going to step through it as we always have with the tremendous team that we have in place, maybe a few adjustments, but we do not have an a, accompanying proposal to add you know, handfuls of permanent staff to the capital projects department at this time. Any other questions? Seeing none, I just want to uh, throw a, a couple things out, <clears throat> not questions. Um, I sat as a steering committee member uh, for this group over the, I don't know, year plus process it seemed. Um, and, you know, just the data that this group put together, the surveys, the input from the community, I think it's to be commended. And, you know, we should really understand that, you know, Mr. Mills made this seem like it's pretty simple and pretty easy and here's this thing and oh, by the way, here's your, you know, here's your marching orders. But I think, uh, you know, the, the technical ability of their group to put this together and work with our community on some really difficult or discussions uh, is to be commended. So I, I, I wanted to throw that out there. The process was fantastic. It is a hard subject. It's not easy. Uh, I think there's probably, you know, even as the, the capital team starts to put things into play, uh, some of those conversations are going to come back up. Uh, there's the data there to support it. So at least that piece is, 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 uh, is good. So I uh, really appreciate the work that you all did for this. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. i just like to add thank you for incredible um, this whole presentation and the work that you've done, uh, I love it because uh, it's really outside the box of anything we've ever done before in really reimagining um, reutilization of schools, um, repurposing kind of all, every, every piece of this kind of gives us, um, you know, it's different pieces of the puzzle we're putting together differently, not just continuing build another school, build another school, build another school. What's happening not only to the older ones, but utilization of those and efficiencies that we really need that I think, um, uh, and the ability to use it for, uh, for other things, whether it's for the school district or community group, you know, whether it's for, you know, communities and schools, who's an amazing um, partner, uh, Boys and Girls Club, Children's Cabinet. I mean, we could just start naming all the different agencies that fit right in to support for kids, for education and for families. Um, gives us a lot of additional options. So uh, really appreciate the, um, the options that are here and kind of as we move forward, uh, you know, seeing what is going to work best, but um, incredible amount of data and time and uh, input from um, your group, the group that has done this, uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Andrea. Uh, as you know, a very new member to this group, but certainly not new to the community, um, I, I think the celebration of WC1 needs to really also be the focus, because I don't think we could even be here without WC1. This project couldn't even happen without WC1. And to know that you're able to plan and project out that far and then use, as Mr. Solero stated, in terms of data points and, and projections of growth and, 
and what that looks like in our community, but to have a sustainable piece in, in place that allows consistency in terms of the bust and, and growth that we've seen um, that Mr. Ivory shared, um, I think is, is really a celebration to those that worked really hard on that. So I just don't wanna lose sight of what, what this is all about, really. So um, maybe it's because I'm so new that I, you know, feel like WC1 is, is, is one to be celebrated. But since I have the floor, I will echo Councilwoman <laughs> Bybee on the stone gate. When Mr. Slayer looked at me, I think he thought I was gonna say a question. I guess it's more of a statement. I think every school is important. Um, but I do think, and I don't know when you answered um, Councilman um, Reese's uh, question in terms of the matrix that you used, but sometimes it makes me wonder as you were going through a very well put together presentation. That's a, a lot to share in a succinct way. So thank you for that. But um, the overpopulation or um, having a school that is definitely, we all know the history of various schools that really, how they were running, it's surprising that they all got through, but they did. But there's also an academic component. And I think um, Mr. Dis explained um, the Pine Middle School as an example in terms of just the socioeconomic um, location of that particular school. And so overcrowding, and I'm not picking on schools because I know McQueen was already stated as number one, so I'm not wanting to be competitive here. But, um, you know, a, a school, you know, in Galena, for instance, versus, you know, looking at a school in another location economic and that socioeconomic, that overcrowding, I think there's an academic correlation that may be um, also a data point Then I was curious if you use that. Because overcrowding in, for instance, a Galena versus another socioeconomic area that maybe doesn't have the same um, status, um, I wonder if that also is given in terms of the priority because really when it comes down to this, it's about children being able to be successful and graduate. I mean, really, when you step back, all of this is about that. And so I think that that is a data point that you know, may or may not have a place in the analysis, but I think at least warrants me bringing it up and then don't forget about Stonegate because I hope that even though we, we look at it a year from now or look at everything, Sometimes, as you know, construction projects, you look at the growth and then you're catching up. And then you're catching up. So I hope that we're not in that position because 2039 is a long time. I don't even know if I'm gonna be here in 2039. I didn't wanna add, add I will? Okay. I, I was a little concerned about you know whether <laughs> I'll get to see Stonebrook, but um, since it's in my area as well, I share Sparks as well. So. Um, I, I, I do do want to thank everybody and, and the staff and all of the hard work. I, I think that um, we need to, you know, acknowledge that as well. So thank you. If, if I could um, address your question or your statement, um, you pointed out a, a fundamental aspect of doing portfolio planning like this, looking at the capacity and utilization of the, the spaces and assets that you have is fundamental to this work. We looked at groups of schools as well as individual schools. Um, where we have at our disposal opportunities for rezoning, which is a no-cost solution, which is great. It means just like Stonebrook, at the end of the day, by delaying that project, it enables so many other projects to move forward because you're not concentrating in a brand new school where you can solve it with a policy decision. Um, where we had managed growth um, focuses towards the very front and that metric was in place, like it jumped the line to make sure that North Valley's was taken care of because there is no rezoning out of that problem. Now, Debbie Smith will help a little bit. However, the projected enrollment in that school, while dipping a little bit in the near term, picks back up. It's just not at the clip that it was when WC1 was envisioned originally, where there would be a new high school in um, the Cold Springs area. And we've been very consistent and intentional about stating how that high school is still the plan. It's just not yet. Thank you. All right, uh, not seeing any other, co oh, Mr. Martinez. 
Thanks so much, Mr. Chair, and excuse my tardiness as well um, for the beginning of the meeting. Um, you just have to clean the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cersei and uh, the Canon Design Group for all the work that you've done um, to get us to this place. I also want to commend all of our community members who ended up voting for WC1 to pass and just allowing us the opportunity to be here to, you know, speak about all these opportunities to inc increase the education opportunities for our community members and so as we go through the process I just want to make sure that we keep that in mind and that we engage with our community and get that feedback from them throughout the process and I know those things are already placed and so I just want to commend the school district for also increasing language access and making some of those surveys in English and Spanish and I know I took one of them in Spanish just to see kind of what it looked like and it definitely provided the same access whether you were Spanish speaker or an English speaker to provide your input in that and so I appreciate that opportunity for folks to be able to do that and I know we're not part of the rezoning committee but I also want to echo some of the uh, comments made by Councilwoman uh, Vibe about uh, the distance for our elementary school and middle school students um, to travel to other places and high school students that may not be able to have transportation especially um, at Pine Middle School who may have to go to hers or to Poli um, and may not have the opportunities to stay for those after school activities um, whether it's a parent not being able to pick them up and them having to leave school and ride the bus to get home and so just could be considerate of those things as we move forward and again as I said I know we're not part of that zoning committee but I want to make sure I put that um, out there as we move forward in these processes so again thank you all thanks to the staff for the work that you've done as well um, and I look forward to continuing to engage in this process thanks again all right uh, since this is an action item I'm gonna go ahead and call for public comment if we've got any public comment on this item Pablo Navadron Hello, uh, my name is Pavna Duan. Um, I currently live in the New World area. I'm a Galena High School graduate and uh, also a Pine Middle School alumni. So very sad to see of Pine's closing, say about the Pine. And then uh, I know you're not, I know you're a capital funding community, protection community, not a zoning advice community or naming advice community. So I got a lot of questions. So number one, um, when you close the pond, we purpose to uh, elementary school or PK to A school. The, you guys uh, gave it opportunity to give the community to name of uh, like PK to uh, eight school, like maybe name of a school that give it of a near world community. Because our people, we don't live, uh, we don't live a, a community when Pine Middle School was built, but we moved there during the 1990s. Uh, just current that day. So, and number two, I, uh, I thank you, Danny, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Miguel Martinez, that have an opportunity about my neighborhoods. Of course, with Pine Mill School because Pine Mill School looking disadvantaged student. Yeah, I live close to Pine Mill School, and I heard uh, the my reason to hers and Galena because I'm one of those students who. Went on bus to Galen High School every single day for four years, and then, and Adam sees you told me that uh, we rezoned to Damari Ranch High School because uh, there are so so for Damari Ranch High School. So, so you're not. I know you guys not part of zoning vice community, but I feel like the best solution if you wanna to increase the potential rate for the near world area. Um, so we just rezone to the new Vaughn Middle School or the new re newly rebuilt new Booster High School here, the current campus, or a Hidden Valley one. But the problem is uh, the game rival over there because uh, because of rezone of Vaughn and Wooster to have a game conference over there. So if you want to rezone that, I think about higher increase of police school police. You're not board trustee. So this is a not a easy solution, but but if you want to read some to hers or to Poli, this is not easy decision. That the middle school used to have like the pitching and after school board sport at Pine Middle School and after school club, very good activity at after school at Pine. So I feel like this is not having same opportunity as their. Going to Herzl, Herzgalino, or Dupoli, or 
the money. So that's an accurate issue for them. So this is not easy solution. So and uh, also plus, uh, what to do with the hidden value when option B or C? Because their woman is very low. So I want to touch with that and. Uh, also, last question about the Dover, Sparks, and Trainer. I do support option C and D. I do support rebuilding of Spark Mill School. So, there you go. Go Golden Bear. So, there you go. So, I, and I, also I do support the, the study option for PK to ACE um, school choice. So, there we go. So, thank you. Any other public comment on this item? There's no more public comment. All right, we'll bring that back to the board, and uh, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I recommend approval of the draft final district-wide facility modernization plan by the board of trustees. I'll second, I'll second that motion. Got a We're out of time. Motion by Reese, a second by uh, Bybee. Uh, <laughs> all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, that'll take us on to item 2.03, which is a presentation, discussion, and possible action to approve the 2023 annual accountability report. Uh, Mr. Oh, Ms. Golden is going to take us on this one. I'll just introduce this briefly. This is a requirement of the board policy 9405, which guides this committee. Um, we've presented a similar form and fashion in years past. This item is for action. Um, and I'll turn the floor over to our Director of Design and Planning, Teresa Polson. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to try something new and stand tonight. We'll see how it goes after <laughs> <laughs> sitting so long. Um, as Adam mentioned, thank you very much for, um, for being here. But as Adam mentioned, this is a board policy that we um, come to this uh, committee to re do our report every year, but we do also like to highlight our accomplishments that our capital improvement program and staff have have done. Um, slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, wanted to start out by pointing out our data data gallery website, where you can find uh, quite a bit of information in regards to our capital improvement program. Um, but specifically today, we'll talk about the capital renewal program. We'll touch on our energy efficiency and our major projects, which are located under the building home tab on that data gallery uh, page. So in regards to capital renewal, uh, that, that uh, slide, <coughs> or excuse me, that web page has a ton of information in regards to our future maintenance projects at any particular site. So you can go onto that site, select any school or even a non-education school and find out what the ma future maintenance deeds are. It'll show the scope and the cost for those projects. Um, in addition, uh, purchasing, our purchasing department does also post our construction bidding results for um, the previous projects that have been bid at, again, any location that you can select on that website. I'd like to talk about our um, project prioritization and how we come about our capital renewal list every year. Uh, we do have assessment staff that go out to all the sites every year. They inspect uh, carpet, concrete, railings, roofing, everything you can think of. Um, they assess those on all the buildings and they put that information into our facility condition index software, um, which helps create that priority for all of our projects every year. Uh, we take that information and then we also meet with our maintenance staff and get input from them and we put pricing uh, to all of those projects that includes design and permits and all those other associated fees with the projects. And that's how we create our capital renewal list that we then come to you and ask for the money for the following year to take care of those projects. So this is a, our list of allocations and investments for our capital renewal program. Um, this is money that has been allocated and money spent since the passing of WSC1 back in 2016. Um, we have spent now more than uh, $245 million on those projects. I just wanted to point out that all of the projects for all of those allocations through 21 are 100% complete. We do have a few projects that we're still working on in the FY22 program and the FY23. Um, you'll notice that there is a little bit of money still sitting in all of those allocations 
and that money that's sitting there really is due to projects that have either come in over or under budget um, or it's program administ administration money that's still sitting in those allocations. Um, program administration is for salaries, it's for everything else, your overhead, if you will, um, uh, supplies, software, et cetera, for um, the capital projects uh, bond program. Next slide, thank you. Uh, just a little bit more detail about the FY23 um, projects specifically. We do have approximately 104 projects in that program. 63% um, of those are complete, 19% are in construction, and 18% are in design. Um, this is just a snapshot of our building home web page. On this page, uh, it gives us information about our major projects that are currently going on. Um, our major projects we define as either new schools or expansions. Um, communication does quarterly reports uh, for us for those major projects, which is very helpful. Get a snapshot of um, the status of those projects at any time. Um, this page also has information in regards to zoning, school naming, it has information about this committee, its role and function within our program, and uh, lots of information about the facility master plan report that you just heard about. This is our list of major projects. Um, again, since the passing of WC1, as you can see, we have almost approached a billion dollar mark in um, total invested funds for these projects. Um, it shows the status of all of those. Currently, we have three listed that are um, still in progress. The facility, facility modernization plan is one of those. And then, of course, we're, we're still working on bond and transportation, which you'll hear about here shortly. So for the FY23 program, the change orders that we saw for our capital renewal projects were at 4.2%. Um, those, these, all of these um, change orders are based on the POs that were closed in FY23. For major projects, the change orders are currently at 6.1% for FY23. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about that number because we were a little bit uh, taken aback because it was a little bit higher than, than last year's, as you can see. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. In, in the FY23, we, we closed POs for two major projects that were actually CMAR projects. And um, the POs that were closed were, let's see if I can talk through this. They were POs that were closed that were part of a, a multi-phase, multi-year project. So it kind of skewed the percentage numbers a little bit as far as the FY23 program. Um, and in addition to that, and probably more importantly, those change orders include the contractor uh, CMAR change orders also, uh, which really is not a true sort of owner change order. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, but we'll be looking at that and, and taking that information out of the, the, the uh, report for next year. So is there any questions on that? <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Energy efficiency, uh, our website here has a really great information in regards to our utilities. Again, at all of our sites, you can select any school, um, you can select the admin building, you can see how much energy we're using, both in terms of use and cost. And uh, it also gives us great information in regards to um, monitoring data analytics. It helps us identify problems if we're seeing high energy use at any particular site or water leaking, uh, we can identify those. Um, and so we turn those into projects. We do allocate about a million dollars a year for um, towards these energy efficiency projects. So in conclusion, we have spent over $25 million out of our approved $40 million FY23 program for capital renewal and over $160 million of investments toward our major projects program. However, it is not in FY23, that is since inception of the WC1. So apologize for that mistake. Um, this um, presentation is for action today, and that concludes my presentation. Any questions? 
Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Polson? Mr. Ivory. Thank you. Um, so on the energy efficiency, mm -hmm. do we have any kind of numbers? I, I know you guys are big on crunching numbers all the time. So do we have any kind of numbers at all as to like per year moving forward with the efficiency uh, standards and stuff that we're meeting on these schools? How much are we saving the general fund? Um, I don't have that answer um, for you today, but I certainly can follow up with you. Um, I know we have a ton of information in regards, not only on the website specifically, you can see savings at each school, um, but in, in terms of the overall program, I don't have that number, but I can certainly follow yeah, up. Yeah, I'd be curious with as you. to, I'm sure it's getting bigger and bigger every year. Yeah. But, um, I would think, yeah, based perfect. on the investment that we're making. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? It is an action item, so I'll go ahead and take public comment if we have any public comment on this item. There's no public comment. All right, thank you very much. Bring it back to the board. I would uh, entertain a motion. Uh, I was going to just, I'll second. All right. <laughs> motion by Reese, second by Andreola. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All right. That takes us on to item 2.04, which is a presentation and discussion uh, to update uh, this committee on the E. Otis Vaughn rebuild construction phase uh, budget. Ms. Paulson. Thank you. So yeah, this is really cool. This is actually our very first project as a direct result of the FMP, right? First core school project. So this is pretty exciting. Um, so starting without, uh, starting with background again, you, you already heard Paul just talk quite a bit about the uh, facility modernization plan and um, it was identified pretty quickly on that Vaughn Middle School was selected as the first school that would receive a full uh, rebuild um, at that site, not only due to age, but you know, educa educational adequacy, adequacy isn't great at that school as well. So we're, we're re really excited to get the design started and going in December of 2022. We retained TSK architecture for the project for design and Clark and Sullivan as the construction manager at risk. We have done a lot of work over the past few months and uh, will be culminating design here within the next 30 days. So we started, uh, of course, meeting with the staff and do, doing programming with the Vaughn staff and identified you know, some unique characteristics of that school. They have an international baccalaureate program there as well as the deaf, hard, and hearing program that we've been really sensitive to, um, to design around. Uh, the building at this site is the prototype of O'Brien. Um, however, we've moved some parts and pieces around. It is a site adapt design. Um, part of the reason we had to move things around quite a bit is because the size of this site is very small. It's like 9.3 acres, and most of our sites are about double that size for a middle school. So it has been, been a pretty good challenge fitting everything on site. So. Um, it is a 1,200 student capacity, which is the same as O'Brien. We've done quite a bit of coordination with the city of Reno um, during our administrative review. Um, we have agreed to a number of significant offsite improvements for, for pedestrian and um, vehicular safety around the school. And this is also a joint use park with the city of Reno and it will continue to be so when the school is done. So just a little bit about the site and the, uh, the phasing. So looking at this plan, the, um, the existing fields are on the Vassar side of the street right now. And so just like O'Brien, uh, we do propose to build the new school on, um, in an L shape on Vassar and Yori, with Yori being the new school entrance to the school. And then on uh, Bresson side where you see the fields, that's where the existing building is. So phase two will be to go in, demolish the existing building, and then rebuild those fields on the back side. Uh, 
This is a site circulation plan of the vehicular circulation. This is what it'll look like when the school is completed. Um, you'll see the red dash line on the uh, right hand or the east side of the site that is intended to be the bus drop off. The buses will enter on Bresson, they'll exit on Vassar. Um, the red dash line you see at the bottom there is really intended only for the special education buses to take that route and exit on Yori. The top dash blue line is the student parent or the yeah, student parent drop off. Um, they will enter on Yori. They have a pretty good size queuing line there and will exit on Bresson. You know, currently there is no on-site student drop off for that school, so uh, we tried really hard to make sure that that was accommodated. And then on the southwest sort of area where you see the, the blue and the red dash area, that's a par public parking lot basically for, for public to come in um, to park and then they can enter the school on that Yori side. Um, just some noted changes and or improvements that I wanted to highlight that we're doing here that we uh, did not include at Vaughn. Um, well, first of all, the score footage, let's address that. Uh, <laughs> the school is about 12,000 square feet larger than um, O'Brien. And the main reason for that is because of the building blocks that we had to kind of move the building around and rearrange it, we had to add some circulation corridors. Uh, that were necessary. We also increased the width of some of those main corridors in the school. We had some complaints from O'Brien staff that it was just very tight in between um, passing school passings, that it, it, was, it got real tight for the students to pass, so we did widen some corridors. And then we ended up with a, a second floor mezzanine at the media center, which is kind of ended, ended up being a bonus, bonus space for us that can be used for you know, any kinds of classes or pull out education, whatever it may be. Um, but it did add a little bit to the score footage, but we consider that a, a pretty good bonus. Uh, renewables, we were not able to do a geothermal field at this site, again, because the size of the site, we just couldn't accommodate it. So we did want to include some sort of a renewable. Uh, so we are planning on solar on the roof at, uh, at this school. We are including two shade structures interior wall protection on some of the main corridors, and interior wayfinding. Um, these are items that were not included. Some of these newer schools, and there's been a lot of comments and um, that it would be of great benefit. Interior wayfinding, especially the bigger these schools get, we're finding that we, we need to make sure we get some good wayfinding. A couple more items that I forgot to list on here um, is the cell tower. We have a giant cell tower in the middle of our in the middle of our school field right now, so that will be need to be re relocated as part of this project. It will stay on site but be moved. Um, and then, as I did mention earlier, earlier the um, significant number of offsite improvements that we'll be making as well. So our construction phase estimates for this project currently are 120 million to 125 million. Um, that is based on a $109 million construction estimate that was received from Clark and Sullivan for the construction. It also it does include professional services and FF&E. Um, just as a general information, the breakdown on that construction number is phase one is approximately $100 million, and then phase two for the fields is, is the $9 million that you see there. Our schedule, um, as I stated earlier, will be completing design within about 30 days. Um, we are heading in for permitting immediately thereafter. Um, bidding we intend on starting in uh, March. That is, of course, with your consent of this committee um, in February 1st. Um, rolling into construction in June, having the school open in August of 26, and then we would go in and demo that old school and construct the fields and be complete spring of 27. Our next steps are to come back to this committee in February for our uh, GMP-1 phasing um, construction request for funding. And then we would come back in uh, probably 20, late 25 for our GMP-2 construction funding for, for that portion of the work. This is an informational only presentation.
And that's it. Do you have any questions? All right, Mr. Dis. Thank you for that, uh, Ms. Paulson. Um, 1,200 student capacity. How many students currently go to Vaughn? There are, hold on, I have that here. I think it's 600, sorry, 571. Okay. Um, and then currently there's a food pantry at yes. Vaughn that services families there and also from Libby Booth in the area. Has space for that been accounted in this new design? Yes, it is, and a better space. Good. More improved, improved space, I should say. Yeah. Bye, B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I'm looking at your construction phase estimates, mm -hmm. um, 56% increase from O'Brien that we just built. Is this strictly inflation? Because well, every item on it is higher, and I know that as a city, inflation is what killed our budget this year. So right. we're all dealing with inflation. I know Debbie Smith, we had a year delay because of inflation. Is this just inflation, or what else is contributing? That's yeah. huge. So it is huge, and um, yeah, it's kind of shocking number. <laughs> Um, it's not just inflation. Um, if you know, I know it just got completed, but it was bid back in 2020. So um, you know, when we did our our initial um, estimates for that project, we I sort of calculated about 10% a year for escalation. So if you do that using escalation, about 10% a year, and then you add, of course, the additional square footage that we talked about. That's a significant number. It's about 12,000 square feet, and it, that equates to about six million dollars. Um, so you add that on, it gets pretty close to that 109 million dollar number, plus the other little additional items that we spoke of earlier too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any <laughs> Mr. Ivory? I I, I got to agree. Um, I I think on. The hundred and nine million dollars is, you know, remember when we used to build these things for seventy and thought right. that was high. Um, is a fifty six percent increase. I, mean, I, I know logistically you, there's all sorts of stuff that the contractors are gonna have to deal with. The number that I'm really struggling with here is why is the design, the professional services, why is it double? We're we're not talking about a fifty six percent increase, we're talking over two hundred and Last time I checked on the design professional, it didn't matter about where the project was at because they're mostly working in the same offices that they design all these at. Yeah. Plus, we've already got, or should already have, I, 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 get, the, I get that we're re, rearranging this, but the O'Brien situation was we were um, designing something that we could use on different sites so we weren't recreating something brand new every time. So that's that's the numbers that are sticking out to me is the FF and E's and as, especially the professional services. I know it's it's the smallest number on here, so you know what are we gonna you know, we're we're jumping over dimes here maybe uh, or jumping over dollars to to look at dimes, but I'm I'm really curious about that. More yeah, than so Professional services is not the design of the project. That is actually a separate number. So our professional services, this is so solely just construction phase professional services. So this um, consists of um, the environmental oversight, so the hazardous abatement consultants that we need to hire for, for oversight of that. Um, it includes uh, construction management. It includes special inspection special inspections and roof inspections and then building commissioning. So um, again, we did add, I believe if I remember correctly, about 10% escalation from our, from our O'Brien numbers. And then I think we add a little bit more contingency onto that just in case. And, and I understand these aren't, obviously aren't hard fixed numbers sure. yet. Um, but is there a possibility um, as these numbers are getting bigger and bigger on these uh, professional services, can, can we can we request a break out of these so we can at least be keeping track of where those numbers are going also mm -hmm. uh, fr from one school to the next? Sure. Uh, with some explanation. Yeah. I think it 
for me it'll make it easier yeah I, I know I've had a thorn in my side when we're doing a CMR project and then right hiring a CM so um, understood thank you yeah any other questions all right seeing none thank you for the information and we'll Absolutely. see you again in February Okay. Actually, we'll, we'll see you again, see right, you again now. right now. So uh, moving <laughs> on to item 2.05, presentation and discussion to update the Capital Funding Protection Committee on the Central Transportation Yard improvements. All right, on the home stretch. We can go ahead and advance. Oh. Not on non-action items. All righty, this is our update on our central transportation project. We could go ahead and advance to background or history. All right. So a little bit of history on this project. This one has been going on for quite some time. We uh, originally started a master plan study for all three of our transportation sites back in uh, May of 2020. And uh, central transportation site did uh, rise to the top of um, a complete modernization and rebuild of that site. So we did begin a conceptual design at that time in 2022, brought that to this committee and the board and design funding was approved in December of 2022. Um, so again, we have been working diligently on our designs and uh, our design is culminating for this project again in about 30 days. So the justification really for this project uh, originally started really due to flooding at that site and the location. Um, the building has been flooded numerous times over the years. We actually ended up moving our grounds building from that site down to our Brown Center location. We have underground fuel tanks there as well, which of course aren't great during a flood. Um, but in addition, the fuel dispensers, the fuel monitoring at, at that site um, are out, quite outdated. We can't get parts. Um, so it's been quite problematic. It's actually been, I think, shut down a few times um, over, the, over the past few years. Safety and security at that location is, is uh, definitely an issue. Um, doesn't have great lighting or security in regards to cameras, et cetera. Uh, the, our parking is inadequate. A good majority of the staff parks their cars on the uh, Kleppy Lane Street, which quite frankly shouldn't be happening. Um, and then of course, just improving the workspace um, in general for the staff and the drivers. There's 192 staff that work at that site and um, their training facilities, et cetera, really are not appropriate. So the scope of our project really is to completely demolish the White Fleet and Yellow Fleet, um, the shops and their office buildings, um, constructing a new uh, building that will um, house both functions. Right now they're separate buildings. Um, and then uh, construct a new bus wash and above ground fuel tanks and dispensers and rework the overall circulation and parking for the site. This is just giving you a lay of the land of the existing uh, plan uh, and how it lays out now. The phase one and two really is all the clouded area in red um, on the east side of the site. That is where our white fleet exists. Um, that is where we would demo that whole side first, construct the new building on that east side. And then phase three, what we're calling phase three, it would be demolishing the um, yellow fleet on that side and then completely re, uh, redoing that parking lot on that uh, west side. So this is our proposed plan showing the new building on that east side with the new entrance on the east side parking um, and the bus parking on the west side. We have the fuel islands and uh, the fuel dispensers and our wash bay sort of in the center of the site so buses can just pull right into that center drive aisle, drive straight through, get their services and pull out the north side of the site. We are including two EV chargers for buses at this site at, the t at this time in our scope. Uh, but we do have um, alternates in our in our bid package to provide infrastructure for another, I think it's 20 or so EV 
uh, buses, assuming that's kind of where we're headed most likely. So this is our floor plan. It's about a 35,000 square foot building. Our existing buildings are around, I believe, 23,000 square feet right now. Um, the office space, as you can see, is on the left side of the building, um, where the, and there you can see the main entrance. That left side is constructed of conventional CMU, and then our shops on the right-hand side and the top are constructed of pre-manufactured metal building. We are moving our dispatch a group from our south facility into this site um, for better radio coverage, provided a, a decent training facility and conference room and break room um, for the staff. Again, I think it's like 192 people. It's a lot of people coming in, in and out of the site. The um, bus bays, we are increasing the, that shop spa space by two, sorry, three new bus bays and uh, one new uh, white fleet bay for maintenance. Um, these are the elevations of the new building. You can see the entry there on the left-hand side on the top. We have a small covered patio for staff, so right outside the break room, so they can come outside, sit outside for lunch. We have a mezzanine there that you see um, that's popping up. That's We're using that for our HVAC equipment. And then you can see the white fleet um, shops on the right-hand side there. On the bottom drawing on the left hand side we have created this sort of outside drive for really quick maintenance um, for the buses they can pull in maybe get I don't know air in their tires change a windshield wiper little quick things and then they can drive out and instead of having to drive through the main shop and that's it on that side so our construction phase estimates for um, this project are between 60 and 65 million dollars uh, that is based on a $55 million estimate uh, for construction only from a third party. And again, includes professional services uh, that are listed below. We do have a few, one or two additional professional services part of this pro project due to the environmental uh, fuel tanks and that type of thing. And then of course our FF and E. Our schedule. Again, we're, we'll be complete with design in about 30 days and roll right into permitting. We are planning on bidding this project also in March after approval of this committee for funding um, and then rolling into construction in June. Um, we plan on bidding our phase three of this project in December of 25 and then uh, completion of the building probably spring. I'm hoping earlier than June and then finishing up that parking lot on the west side um, the summer of 26. The, just a note about the bidding schedule, I know it is almost mirroring the bidding schedule for Vaughn. We are really, really sensitive to that, so we are offsetting the, the bid due date between those two projects by about two, two and a half weeks, so they won't be bidding exactly at the same time. Uh, our next steps. For this project, again, are to come back to this committee um, for phase one construction, phase approval in February of 24, and again for phase two um, in December of 2025. This is informational presentation. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Any questions on this one, Mr. Ivory? I don't know if I missed it in the presentation, or is this a hard bid project, or is this a CMR? Yes, it's a hard bid. I should have pointed that out. Okay. It is a hard bid. Um, and then the next question is, I'm just curious, on the buses. So how many buses will this facility house, I guess? Yeah, let me get that for you. Um, so we're providing 220 stalls <clears throat> for right now, currently they have 187 buses. So we do have some room for growth, a little bit of growth there. Okay, and, and we've got... We're projecting, so we're going to have two EV stations with an expansion of 20. 20 more. Mm -hmm. 20 more. Yep. Um, which is going to be about 10%. So I guess my question is, we, what, what's going to happen in 10 years if we've got a, an entirely electric bus system? I'm not saying we're going to have 10 years, but 10, 15 years. What, what's, what's the... Well... 
Is it even I, – let me ask you this. Is it even possible to get enough power on site to charge 220 buses? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Uh, probably not. You'd probably have to improve the – increase the power at that time. But for now, we're planning on the 20. Um, it's been kind of a slow process up to now, even with – we just got our first two EV chargers down at our south site. Um, however, there's a lot of grants out there right now, it sounds like, that are coming out for EV buses. So that's why we at least wanted to accommodate 20. We're not sure how quickly that well, and I know that happen. obviously on a much smaller scale, but with the uh, uh, tablets that we're putting at all the schools, we're learning a lot about how you charge things because you can't plug in 1,500 tablets at one time. Right, yeah. so they have to they have to go into carts and stuff. So, I guess my next question would be: When you're charging a bus, yeah, uh, for a day long use, do you have? Does it take you know? Is, does it take eight to twelve hours to charge it, or is it something that that 20, 20 charging stations is actually going to be able to charge sixty buses? Yeah. So, I do know that there's different ways of charging depending on I think it's the rectifier that you buy. There's different types that can accommodate. In, in this case, we wanted to be able to charge at least 20 buses at one time, so we had to buy a certain type of rectifier. But there's other types that will charge in sequence over more hours. So I would think that at some point, that's kind of what almost we might have to do on at least a portion of buses, right? That's the best I can answer that question. <laughs> I, I guess all I would ask then yeah. maybe is, um, because this is going to be a facility that I think we would all expect is going to be used over the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. yes. um, that I don't know if there's an opportunity to maybe partner with, you know, we got some pretty smart people in this town. So I, I got a feeling maybe we pull some Tesla people in, some, some people in and, and maybe educate us so that we're at least not, you know, hey, nobody loves to drive down a freshly paved road that's got a ditch right up the middle of it because all of a sudden we got to add something else to it, right? right? So that, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, is no, I, understood. Point taken. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Very thank good. Thank you. All right. That takes us on to item number 3.02. Uh, our next meeting will be February 1st, 2024. Uh, presumably in this very same room, 4 o'clock. Yeah, unless we build another one between them. That's right. Uh, exactly. Uh, and with that, uh, we will adjourn the meeting. <laughs>